welcome to the After On Podcast. I'm your host, Rob Reed, and this is a series of conversations with thinkers, founders, and scientists. Take a little time and stretch out, because these talks are unhurried and meant to bring you to a top percentile understanding of something important. So, whether you're into startups or ideas, a techie or a lit major, take your time, engage your mind, and you'll be glad you did it. Especially this week, when we'll be talking to... Stuart Brand. Stuart is often equated to the mythical world's most interesting man who was featured for years in those Dos Equis commercials. Often enough that the comparison's a bit of a cliché. But like many clichés, there's something to it. Stuart was among the most culturally catalytic people in the turbulent years of the late 1960s, although back then he did a lot of his catalyzing behind the scenes. He went on to become a founding figure in the environmental movement of the early 70s. Later, he created one of the earliest and most influential online communities, which he named The Well. He also convened history's first hackers conference. He co-founded one of the world's premier centers of truly long-term thinking, and these days, In addition to running that, he's helping the renowned bioengineer and genomicist George Church resurrect extinct species like the woolly mammoth. If this makes you think Stuart might be something of an historic figure, you're not alone. He showed up for his interview at my apartment with a production crew who were filming a documentary about his life. Meanwhile, John Markoff, who for decades at the New York Times was among the world's most influential and well-regarded tech journalists, is writing a biography about Stuart. For the same reasons that Stuart attracts this sort of attention, I'm taking an unusual approach to this episode. Rather than focusing solely on a single deep and complex aspect of his work, Stuart and I speak broadly about the sweep of his experiences and the unique perspective they've given him on technology, the environment, and our prospects of navigating the coming century. As regular listeners know, the conversations I present are always unhurried, but Stuart and I set a new record in unhurriedness. In part because we go back a ways. We've known each other for years. We've attended countless conferences together. We've gone on weekend brainstorming retreats with small groups. We even spent a week in Havana with a handful of friends a year and a half ago. So since we're friends, it was a bit easier than usual to lose track of time. And we ended up having a really long and really fabulous conversation. And I wrestled a bit with its length because I wanted to be respectful of your time as listeners, but I also didn't want to fully discard any of the fun tangents or deep dives that our conversation included. So I decided to do an experiment. What I'm presenting in this podcast is a semi-abridged version of our conversation, although weighing in at an hour and a half, you definitely wouldn't call it brief. It touches on all the main epochs of Stuart's career, as well as most of the thoughts he shared with me about tech, the environment, and where we're all heading. But I also made a second version of this interview. You might think of it as the director's cut, which I've posted for supporters of this podcast on Patreon. That version's about 50% longer than this one and includes a lot more of everything, more anecdotes, more cultural history, quite a bit more about the 60s, deeper thoughts and detail on every phase of Stewart's life, etc., etc. And it better captures the truly unrushed ambiance of a recent afternoon that slid into a golden twilight as Stuart and I discussed his unique and original Western American life. And patrons, you may want to stop listening to this version right now and jump over to the Patreon version, because all those extra minutes are scattered in bits and pieces throughout the interview as and where they were originally uttered. So it's not a collection of outtakes, but a fully integrated, but just much longer version of this interview. Since my patrons are in the habit of diving deeper into my work via the bonus content I post to my private feed, I'm pretty confident that they will see the 45 minutes of extra stuff as being a feature rather than a bug. And patrons, one last note, if you missed the recent announcement, you can now access all of my bonus content via a private podcast feed that you can get on your smartphone. Instructions on how to do that are on my Patreon page, which of course is at Patreon dot com slash r-o-b-r-e-i-d um and by the way if you're new to this show and have no idea of what any of that meant patreon is a wonderful site that allows audiences to support independent creative work like mine with voluntary monthly donations you can support me at any level you like listeners back me with amounts that range from one dollar to 150 um five dollars and above unlocks bonus content like the extended stewart brand remix 
A while back, I put out a goal of reaching $4,200 a month from Patreon, which would cover my expenses plus New York City minimum wage for the time I spend working on this show. I'm over halfway there, but now I think I'm going to fall pretty short of that threshold by my target date of June 30th, unless things pick up the pace. This makes the second way of supporting the show all the more important, which is spreading the word about it. Although my audience has been growing pretty rapidly lately, it's still smaller than I need it to be to let me do advertising in a quality way. So if you pass along the tweets I post announcing each new episode or spread the word in the countless other ways that life offers, you could help correct that and time may be running out. The other thing that can help the show a lot is if you'll consider reviewing it or just rating it, which takes no time at all. In iTunes or in Apple's podcasts app, ratings help drive Apple's promotional algorithms. And Apple sits at the center of the podcasting universe. So this really is meaningful. It's free. And it quite literally takes a few seconds. So if the spirit moves you, have at it. And with that, let's join Stuart Brand. Stuart, thank you so much for coming to my apartment. This is my 30th ish episode. And the second one I've actually recorded at home. So thanks for joining me here. Well, we are trying to maximize your convenience. You certainly have. I appreciate it a ton. And I'll let the listeners know that was not the royal we. Stuart is traveling with a film production crew. They're doing a documentary about your life and times, correct? Exactly. And I'm glad that they are here. So although you have an overwhelmingly strong association with Northern California, your roots are actually in the Midwest. Correct. Rockford, Illinois is a town that was 100,000 when I was growing up there in the 40s and is 100,000 now. But it was, uh, you know, a city city and close enough to Chicago to see Gilbert and Sullivan or the Museum of Science and Industry. And that's where the high school trips would go. I got enough Chicago to not be totally strange to big cities. Now, I imagine it was a pretty eclectic move to go from Rockford to Stanford in the mid-1950s. It was a long way to go, and Stanford was still cementing its national reputation at that point. The trip that all of us young brands, my older sister Claire, my older brother Mike, my older brother Pete, and then me, was when we got to be driving age at 16, we would take whatever was the about-to-die family car and drive to one coast or the other and get the hell out of the Midwest. <laughs> and I had an older brother, Mike, at Stanford at that time. Oh, he was there as a student? Yeah, he was there as a student ahead of me. And I basically followed him in everything for the few decades of my life. So I drove to California with a couple of my buddies from Rockford, and we panned gold in the Feather River. And he got out here and he had an ocean. And you only have those things in the Midwest, big lakes. That's something. But I just fell in love with the West, and here I still am. And at Stanford, you majored in biology, correct? Mm -hmm. Now, one of your Stanford professors in the 50s was Paul Ehrlich, mm -hmm. who remains a Stanford professor to this day. But much later than no one could have guessed it at the time, you need to become true founding forces in the environmental movement. What was your professor-student relationship like at that time? So Paul Ehrlich shows up in my senior year. He is not yet a professor. He's an assistant professor. His specialty is population biology, which is sort of a branch of evolution because you're studying basically the sort of genetics of large populations. And his specialty was butterflies. He had the Charles Schultz cartoon of Snoopy dancing, I love butterflies, on his door. And that was Paul. My one bit of field biology I've ever done was of tarantulas in the reserve out back of Stanford called Jasper Ridge. And I did that because I was sort of afraid of tarantulas. And what it meant was that I got to put up a cot and stay up all night on full moon nights and observe what tarantulas did. They were a nocturnal animal. And it was totally cool to be out in Jasper Ridge at night alone with the tarantulas, watching them do not much. Paul Ehrlich was my advisor of that paper. At the time, he said, you know, you should write this up in Scientific American. And I thought at the time, I'm not that ambitious. And I'm now learning, Paul, that you're that ambitious, that he would think you know, any student he deals with he wants to get a national audience for. Him. That's interesting. Well, the great thing that came out of that really was that I then stayed on Paul's list of the people that he sent his papers to as they developed over the years. And he took his interest in animal population and mapped it onto human population. 
And in the late 60s, he wrote a book called Population Bomb in cahoots with Sierra Club and Dave Brower, in which he began basically saying that in the 1970s, the famines will be killing millions of people because there's too many people and not enough food. And it was a giant bestseller, correct? I mean, it was a giant bestseller. He huge was on influence on the public conversation. All of that. He was on Johnny Carson like 20 times. Paul Ehrlich, to this day, is a wonderfully comic exponent of his views. And so they're fun to listen to. He's insulting and quick on the uptake and full of aphoristic, strong statements that are amusing. Not all that long ago, he said that the only thing that was wrong with the population bomb is that it was too optimistic, correct? I wouldn't be surprised. But Paul is still at Stanford, and Paul's opinions have not moved a quarter of an inch, as yeah. I can tell, even though in these respects, they're wrong. And it feels like overpopulation was in some ways, and I don't mean this in the pejorative way that it might sound, but it was in some ways the CO2 of its day in that it was this inexorable civilization empowering force that had been gathering momentum over centuries. Mm -hmm. And when something has been gathering momentum over centuries and nobody's noticed, and then suddenly people do notice, and you're the Paul Revere, mm -hmm. I can imagine that that would be a very intoxicating and also incredibly alarming thing to discover. Mm -hmm. Now, does Paul deserve a certain amount of credit for having maybe a self-negating prophecy? I mean, this was happening. And if you traced out the lines just a little bit further, mm -hmm. all the terrifying things that he predicted could well have happened. Do you think that he was part of the reason why they did not happen, much as some credit George Orwell with preventing mm -hmm. the rise of a global totalitarian society by freaking everybody out with 1984? Or do you believe that the forces that caused population growth to suddenly collapse would have happened without a societal wake-up call? I would say the second in that regard, but he would not. And I think he deserves credit not only for concept of coevolution and for being a very good population biologist. He's a highly esteemed professional biologist. What he does with human demography has been clearly proven to be profoundly wrong yeah. and in many ways harmfully misleading. Because at the time, human demographers were familiar with what they called the demographic transition. The demographic transition, as it was understood then and is very well understood now, is that basically when people get better off in the world, they have fewer children. And in a sense, they have better children. And the women are driving this. And they have always driven this. And Paul would agree with that. And in the countryside, especially when you're early on in the effects of medicine reaching the countryside, you have six or seven children just because you need that many to manage your subsistence farm. Three or four are going to die early on, and therefore you can't count on any of them making it. But once you move to town, it flips, and the value is not in having lots of kids who are going to chase the birds out of the crops, but it's in having kids that can get an even better job than you've gotten in town. And so you go for education and so on. So women are making the choice. They have a choice in town. They don't have a choice back in the village. They get married to some jerk because that's all happens to be all available in their cohort. They're basically under the thumb of his mother, very unpleasantly in many cases. Uh, to move to town is to be able to get rid of the jerk if she wants to. The mother-in-law is not around. And she gets to decide now, thanks partly to medicine, which is available, as to how many kids she's going to have. And that changes everything because she'll have two or fewer. This is very clear today. Mm -hmm. We've had many decades now of this population trend reversing itself. Mm -hmm. I believe when the population bomb came out, it happened to be the peak year of population growth. A few years after it turned up, there was a definite shift because it was looking like a total J-curve, the hockey stick that is going perpetually up. And this is what everybody said to each other. In the year 20, mumble, mumble, the weight of humanity will equal the weight of the earth <laughs> and stuff like that, which is a little strange for a biologist to say because everything we know from real population biology on the landscape is that everything's an S-curve. Yes. And so even when you have an extremely successful invasive, it's going to the J-curve skyrocket and then it's going to level off for you know various reasons. And the J-curve will become an S-curve. That happened for reasons different than happens in animal biology. Yeah. It happened for cultural reasons, not for biological and reasons. And did people anticipate that already? Yes. When Population Bomb came out in 1968, would somebody talking about what you just mentioned, 
sound like a climate skeptic who today might be derided for saying, you know what, in just a few years, the amount of CO2 is going to plummet just like human population did for this, this, and this reason. It was a famous debate at the time. A guy named Barry Commoner was another kind of public intellectual biologist, a little bit of a jerk in person. But I went back and looked at his very popular book back then, I think just the year 68 or something like that, a year or so before Paul Ehrlich's book called The Closing Circle. And Barry Commoner, to his great credit, completely anticipated what was going to happen with climate. With climate? With climate. He talked about climate before almost anybody. Wow. And I think he must have been responding partly to Paul's book without ever naming Paul. He said these worries about an exploding population are misplaced because there's this thing the demographers know about called the demographic transition. And it's going to happen because people are getting better off in the world. It turned out they were getting better off faster, more widely, even than Barry knew. But it was hammer and tongs between those two. I was involved in setting up what turned out to be kind of a, a debate between them in Stockholm at the UN Conference on the Human Environment in 1974 where they're basically yelling at each other. And Paul Ehrlich was my friend. He was my mentor in some respects. He was a teacher I knew a lot about, very commoner. What I'd seen of him, I didn't like very much. And what was wonderfully mind-opening is that my friend Paul Ehrlich was profoundly wrong, as far as I'm concerned, and as I soon discovered. And this kind of jerk, very commoner, was profoundly right. So take your personal relationship opinions out of uh, who might be right or wrong about something. It was the thing to be in a high panic about population and to put every argument you were saying like CO2, like climate, to put every worry in terms of population. Now we've got to do whatever it takes to get the population down. Paul Ehrlich had talked about, let's just put sterile in the water supply, you know, keep things like that. He thought government should solve it. He was probably a big fan of the one-child policy in China. I then, think I he sort of was. And, you know, the research has been done. Where did that come from? It didn't come directly from Paul, but it came from that kind of panic that Paul set in motion. Well, I bought it. I bought the idea at that time. Well, going backward a little bit, when you got out of Stanford, you went into the Army. Mm -hmm. Were you ROTC? Was that something that was kind of predestined based on your undergraduate years? Was that a decision that you made upon graduating to get into the Army? The predestination was my older brother did ROTC at Stanford. You were locked in. And well, there's a kind of a respect for the military in my Midwestern family. In fact, my oldest sister, Claire, married a guy at West Point and stayed with him through his career, and he retired a general. Years later, they are both buried at Arlington in D.C. Your sister and brother-in-law. Yeah. So I did ROTC, which I liked a lot, actually. It was a good course, history of military and various things. And I kind of enjoyed the uniform and close-order drill and things like that. So comes 1960, I'm graduating. The choice is do I become a graduate student in biology, which was being encouraged at the time, and just do six months active duty, stay in the active reserve for bloody ever? Or do I do two years active duty and get kind of serious about being a young officer in the Army and then have much less reserve obligation? I went for the two years. I was also at that point deciding not to be a professional biologist, I think. So two years active duty, I went in the infantry. My older brother had gone in artillery. And this was 1960, correct? This is 1960. So it's the peacetime army. Yeah. Very, very early days in Vietnam. Very early days, which I began to get a glimpse of because what happened is, so the last war was the Korean War. So I went through basic officer training in Georgia at Fort Benning. And then I stayed for ranger training, went through part of that, dropped out, which I hadn't did do airborne training and did my five static line jumps and got my wings and then was assigned to teach basic training at Fort Dix, New Jersey. To teach basic? To teach basic training. Does that mean drill sergeants were working for you in a sense? The reality is for junior officers, you're working for the non-commissioned officers. So I was working for the sergeants, but it's especially true with training. So basically the officers at Fort Dix were decorative. We were stand about, not put our hands in our pockets not pat our swagger stick against our thigh and be very well turned out. 
and look stern and supervise what was absolutely a rote process of yeah. going through the eight weeks of basic training. But it was boot camp for the people who were getting, coming through. Boot- and you were training kids who, many of them probably did go to Vietnam, right? They got their asses shot off, you bet. 1960, I was looking it up last night, there were only maybe 15 or 16 American casualties. But if you were in for two years, it was starting to do its evident Jake yeah, curve. The ones that point. stayed in, certainly, I'm sure, got nailed. Yeah. This is before the draft. So these are volunteers. Yep. And they're great kids coming out of Brooklyn who've never seen a tree that wasn't planted on purpose somewhere and were sort of alarmed at being on bivouac in a forest of trees that weren't planted. <laughs> yeah. And I love what basic training did for them. It got them the hell out of whatever Dodge City they were in. It got them out of a set of family expectations, and many of them volunteered for that reason. And it got them into feeling proud. So we would put them through a lot. And I was leading PT. I was teaching close order drill. We were doing obstacle course where they're saying, I can't go up there. And the sergeant would say, it doesn't matter if you can't go up there. You are going up there. And they would go ahead and go up there. And it would be a you know, 20-foot high, scary thing. And they would come down having realized that they could always do more than they thought they could do. And they would break through that self-imposed glass barrier that everybody puts in front of themselves all the time. So I love training. I love getting training because that happened to me. And I love giving training because that happened to the kids I was working with. But the routine of a peacetime army where you're not in a line unit is pretty debilitating. The great thing was I was by then deciding I was going to be a professional photojournalist. I'd studied writing and I was studying photography. And I managed to persuade the army that I was a photojournalist in this boredom at Fort Dix, I managed to get to the commanding general and say, sir, I'm a photographer. I would love to engage the skill that I have as a photographer. And he said, well, funnily enough, I have a friend at the Pentagon who has a position for a photographer. And so I wound up going to the Pentagon and meeting Jack Kennedy, among other things, my commander in chief, because I was taking the seat of the guy, Captain Cecil Stoughton, who became the official White House photographer for the Kennedy era. You were his follow-up in his old job. Yeah, I was his stand-in over at the Pentagon Wow! in the Office of the Chief of Information. Kind of some reflected glory on the edges of Camelot there. You know, it was Camelot. D.C. was incredible then. The Pentagon was incredible then. And Jack Kennedy rightly saw that special forces, special operations of all kinds was going to be the future of warfare. He was right about that. And the smartest generals were right about that. And I got to go down and photograph the Green Berets. And then we did a book called Special Warfare, all of my photographs. That was the earliest expression of special operations. Well, just because it's kind of a dramatic dichotomy, I'd like to fast forward just a few years from this moment where you're photographing special forces, you have been overseeing boot camp, and a very short period later, a few years The most iconic and influential book about 60s counterculture opens with this mad scene in which you're driving the author into San Francisco on a pickup truck with a sign on the back saying, Custer died for your sins. And on page two, the book reads, Stuart Brand, you're the driver, a thin blonde guy with a blazing disc on his forehead and a whole necktie made of Indian beads, no shirt, just an Indian bead necktie on bare skin and a white butcher's coat with medals from the King of Sweden on it. How did you get from Green Berets with the commander in chief to butcher's coat with the King of Sweden on it? And that's Tom Wolfe in the electric Kool-Aid acid test. Of course, as I need hardly tell you, this is 1966. This is really early times for Indian beads and and crazy pickup trucks in San Francisco. The summer of love is not yet a glimmer in anybody's eye. The Beatles are still largely content with holding somebody's hand. Mm. And you <laughs> are at this point living in the future by a couple of years. That's a big jump from Fort Dix, right? While I was at Fort Dix, on the weekends, I was hanging out with artists in the Lower East Side of New York City. By that time, I was an artist doing audio as well as photography. So I was a soldier by day and an artist by night, basically. That is a very big difference. Your weekends were probably very different from your Monday through Friday when you were at Fort Dix. I was a lot happier driving north to the artist world than I was driving back to the military world. So two years are up. I'm still being a photographer. A friend from Stanford got me work photographing Indians in the Warm Springs Reservation. So I went up there and I photographed the Indians on the Warm Springs Reservation. And 
there was a whole world of contemporary Indians that I didn't know existed. And I discovered that other people didn't know existed. So at that time, this is early 60s, Ken Kesey came out with this book, which had starring Chief Rome, an Indian. One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. And so I sent some of my photographs of Indians to Ken Kesey, who said, well, come on down. Now, you had already experimented with LSD at this point, right? By then, I was experimenting with LSD. You came to it through a medical experiment? It was a mix. Got some psilocybin with artists back east. But coming out of the Stanford world, the mid-peninsula Bay Area world, there was a revived psychiatric model of how to use LSD in these various mind-expanding, quote, quote, drugs. And so I wound up spending $400 to be led step-by-step step through a very therapeutic-oriented process oh, interesting. of working up on taking 400 micrograms of Sandoz lysergic acid diethylamide. $400 is a ton of money in 1962. It was a bargain because oh, really? I wasn't paying for the drugs. I was paying for what they called, they were just developing the concept of set and setting. Got it. Which lasts to this day. But so you got connected with Kesey. He basically really was, I don't know, the Pied Piper of acid on the West Coast, much as Timothy Leary was on the East Coast. Is that a reasonable... That's a good way to summarize it. There were sort of three models of what LSD meant. And what I like about Michael Pollan's book is he points out that people would take these drugs and they would have a profound experience. And instead of just coming back and saying, well, that was interesting, they would come back and say, well, I've got to change my life. In fact, I have to change everybody's life now. And so there was an evangelism, to put it mildly, that came with this. Tim Leary's model was sort of a religious, sacred, spiritual practice model. And so they were doing a lot of you know, studying Tibetan this and that and looking at mandalas and doing sort of yoga and prayers. And, and indeed, my version of that was I spent a lot of time with Indians in peyote meetings, and that became pretty much my version of psychedelics was peyote meetings and the whole marvelousness of how they were organized by Indians. But then the other model was Kesey's, which was, can you pass the acid test? It was basically recreational and creativity enhancing or unleashing. And I also engaged that one. So I was part of what were called the acid test. So Kesey's role was as a charismatic inspirer of doing wild and crazy things. He himself was clearly highly talented and highly creative. His two great books but he gave all that up, and I think Kesey paid a terrible price of becoming a victim or lost in his own story. And I later opined that charisma is theft, and the way the theft of charisma works is that a charismatic person that draws you to be close to them, whether it's spiritual or whatever, basically is drawing you into the story that they're telling the world. And you get to be a character in that story. And it's a big story with a lot of people interested in it. And it's an original and important story. And you're a character in it, but it's their story. And even though Kesey had perspective on his own charisma, could turn it on and off and understood some of the limitations of it, nevertheless, he was always playing to an immediate and in many cases, a very widespread audience and being intensely creative. The best thing I learned from the pranksters, and this came straight from Kesey, was fearlessness. And one of the mottos of the pranksters was, go ahead on, point yourself in a direction and various misgivings will occur. And one of the things Kesey did for people was he would load them with misgivings and have basically no mercy. They're having a bum trip. He's not having mercy about their bum trip. He's not tending them or holding their head or something like that. It's if anything, he's going to make it a little tougher for you. See if you're going to find your way out of this stupid box you got yourself in. So he was a public inspiration and a private inspiration, and a thief. Through his charisma. Through his charisma, and I think a thief of his own freedom. One of the amazing things about that book, and certainly, obviously, by extrapolation, the experiences that you had, is Kesey and the pranksters and you were living what became the iconic prototypical life of the late 60s, mm -hmm. in the early 60s, and then in the mid-60s. And there was this pressure that was building, and then at some point it was going to explode on the world stage. 
And the author of that explosion, ironically, wasn't Ken Kesey, it was Stuart Brand. Or at least that's what a lot of historians claim because of this thing that you put on called the Trips Festival. Hmm. And it was the first major performance by the Grateful Dead in San Francisco. Tom Wolfe said in the Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test, the hate ashbury era began that weekend. Correct. With this thing that you put on, 10,000 people showed up for three days, more hippies than probably the hippies even knew existed. For sure. Tell us about the Trips Festival. The Trips Festival was my attempt to bring competence to <laughs> competence. the married pranksters. One of the pranksters, a guy named Mike Hagan, I had a $20 a month apartment in North Beach. Everybody in San Francisco that is listening to this is weeping at the yes. idea of a $20 a month <laughs> apartment. Are, except in North Beach. for North Beach landlords who are <laughs> delighted that those days are gone. <laughs> anyway, Hagan came by. He said, we're going to do another acid test. By then, there had been five or six so-called acid tests, which were basically just all-night parties. Just big parties with a couple hundred people or something, right? Or a few uh, hundred. that, a few dozen people, a few score people, and take over some you know, collapsed nightclub and be there all night and have strobe lights going. And the warlocks, which were the sort of the you know, this band that became the Grateful Dead, would play if they weren't too drunk. And the deal was, can you pass the acid test? Which is... Fun, because, you know, it's the acid test. It's lots of hippies hated LSD being called acid because it sounded so negative. It was like something that eats your face. Well, damn straight it eats your face. Go ahead and call it acid. And acid tests were kind of doing it again, doing it again. And Mike Hagan came around and said, we're talking about having a big acid test. Let's get all the creative people in the Bay Area in one place and have a trips festival. And that'll be great. And he was gone. I thought, well, that would be great, but there's no, no way, way you're going to organize it. <laughs> These guys are going to do I know that. you guys. No way you're going to organize it. Yeah. And this is actually a watershed in my life because at that point I decided somebody ought to do that. I guess I'm somebody. I could just pick up the phone and call one of these venues and rent a place for, I don't know, maybe a weekend. And say, we're going to have this big old festival, and Keezy and the Pranksters will be there, and I know these various other artists. So I called, picked up the phone, reserved. You could get for a couple of hundred dollars for three nights at the Long Farmers Hall, you know, down by Fisherman's Wharf. And then it was on. And as soon as I had a place and a time and a plan, and I was joined eventually by Bill Graham, who came on sort of as a manager, because he'd been doing events sort of like that. There were benefits for the San Francisco Main Troop. And Bill Graham, who would go on to be the greatest, probably, rock impresario that the Bay Area, if not the country, ever produced. And that's exactly what happened is he said, I have to be part of this to us. And we had very good uh, promo and we did various things that made people all know about it and the columnists were all writing about it. And like you say, 10,000 hippies showed up discovering there were 10,000 hippies. And the Shrift Festival in the Longshoremen's Hall was a hoot. It was way more fun than people had realized they could have on a given Saturday night, especially if the Grateful Dead was playing, because they could really get you on your feet. And in our advertising for it, we said, come dressed for them in celebratory mode. And they did. Yeah. What played very well was the Grateful Dead. What played very well was the audience getting, not being an audience. And a gonzo pedal to the metal, screw it, do it. And things like Ron Boise's Thunder Machine, which was a big sculptural piece of sheet metal, bunches of sheet metal welded together that people get inside and bang on. And partly it's chaos and partly it's music. Participatory art went very well at the Trips Festival. Yeah. Sit there and watch it. Art did not go so well, unless you could dance to it. What's interesting is what you did in the wake of that. One of the few job descriptions you haven't had is astronaut. Yet, as a result of some things that you started doing, I believe shortly after the Trips mm -hmm. Festival, you're very strongly associated with those iconic first images of the Earth seen against the black background of mm -hmm. space. They were everywhere mm -hmm. by the early 70s. You basically popularized that image before anybody would actually seen it. I've had the opportunity a couple of times to talk up things before they existed. This was a case where a good LSD semi-trip that I took, and just 100 micrograms, sort of a crank up your lucidity and crank down your concentration to a tight little focus. What I was focusing on that afternoon was a idea that came to me on the roof of my place in North Beach, where I thought that I was seeing signs of the curvature of the 
Earth from downtown and mentally elevated myself. The curvature of the Earth so you could see sort of like separations between the buildings. I was imagining just, yeah. the buildings were not exactly parallel. Because I've been paying a lot of attention to Buckminster Fuller at this time, as were various other artists that I hung out with. And Fuller was saying that the reason people behave badly on the Earth is they think that it's flat and that its resources are infinite. If they only understood that it's a sphere and that its resources are finite, they would behave responsibly. Even people who travel all the way around the world and come back to where they started, nevertheless, do not have the sense of the Earth as a sphere. They have a sense of a certain circular kind of adventure, which is important, but it's a different story. So my thought was, okay, if I go up a certain height, I would then be able to see that it curves. And if I went up higher still, I would see the curve completely close on itself into a circle. In fact, I would be seeing the Earth as a sphere in space. And we've been in space, I'm saying to myself, in 1966 for 10 years. Sputnik was in 1956. The Russians are putting stuff up into space and toward the moon. The U.S. is putting up the stuff into the space and toward the moon. They're always looking outward. What I did with that entire afternoon was sit about thinking, how can I make a photograph of the Earth from space come about? And with zero resources, creative people in San Francisco now have too much money. In those days, creative people had no money whatsoever. <laughs> And what I decided to do is I needed a button. What an obvious solution. <laughs> <laughs> and the button would say something about a photograph of the Earth from space. And then it sort of spent the rest of the afternoon in my concentrated mind deciding what the button would say. What it came up with was a sort of a paranoid version of why haven't we seen a photograph of the whole Earth yet? And I would send these to Buckminster Fuller and Marshall McLuhan. I had their addresses. And I would send it to all the senators, especially on the space committees, NASA professionals, and their secretaries. I would send it to the Politburo out in, in Moscow. Yeah. yeah. And you were marching around prominent university campuses. And then I went yeah. to the place you always went with any kind of public statement was Sather Gate at the University of California. And I was wearing my top hat with a crystal in the front and a flower coming out the top and a day glow sandwich board and a platform in front of it where I had a bunch of these buttons. It was a conversation about something that didn't exist yet that I thought should of and certainly could exist. And so as a consequence, I got to help frame that it would be consequential. And very earliest images from the weather satellites, ATS satellites, which were synchronous orbit, I put one of those. It's a video image, a pretty good image on the cover of the whole Earth catalog, which I started in the fall of 68. And then by winter of 69, you're starting to get Apollo photographs taken by human beings of what they see as home. Yeah with the desolate moon in the foreground and this lush-looking home planet in the background against darkness. That then flipped everything. And then suddenly you're getting things called Friends of the Earth and various organizations that are adopting the Earth and the planet as their frame of reference. And my earliest memories are from the early 70s. And I just remember that image being everywhere. Mm. That and the yellow smiley face. Mm. <laughs> that is sort of the icons of my childhood, but it was absolutely ubiquitous. And clearly we're at the point where we're going to talk about the Whole Earth Catalog. Before we do, though, to contextualize it, I want to quote a description of it from what's become one of the most famous speeches of this youngish century. And that was Steve Jobs's graduation speech at Stanford. He'd already had the cancer that would later end his life. The speech includes some very poignant reflections about mortality. It's been viewed God knows how many tens of millions of times. I'd recommend anybody Googling it. Mm. And at the very end of this very significant speech, he says, when I was young, there was an amazing publication called the Whole Earth Catalog, which was one of the Bibles of my generation. It was created by a fellow named Stuart Brand, not far from here in Menlo Park, and he brought it to life with his poetic touch. It was sort of like Google in paperback form. 35 years before Google came along, it was idealistic, overflowing with neat tools and great notions. Stuart and his team put out several issues of the whole catalog. And then when it had run its course, they put out a final issue. It was the mid-70s and I was your age. On the back cover was a photograph of an early morning country road, the kind you might find yourself hitchhiking on if you were so adventurous. Beneath it were the words, stay hungry, stay foolish. It was their farewell message, stay hungry, stay foolish. And I've always wished that for myself. And now, as you graduate to begin anew, I wish that for you. Stay hungry, stay foolish. Thank you all very much. But what was this thing that you created? 
which had such a lasting impact over 30 years later that the most significant entrepreneur in tech history hmm. basically quoted and repurposed your sign-off mm -hmm. as his sign-off message. Well, just working from the image, when I was the age of Steve Jobs, when he was paying attention to the whole Earth catalog in the 70s, the image that we were all paying attention to was the mushroom cloud. That was the iconic image. The iconic image of the time was the existential threat, as we now call it, of nuclear war. That was the world as we understood it. And we were organizing sort of our behavior around dealing with that in some fashion. Once the photograph of the Earth from space happened, it completely replaced the mushroom cloud. It completely replaced this scary, negative, doom-laden version of the future. All of that made it real and personal for people. And I was in the process in 1968 of doing an access to tools catalog. And there was a kind of a libertarian angle on it. So asking out what your country can do for you, do what you can for your country, was asking out what your country can do for you, do it yourself. Yeah. So it was a unleashing of individual power, which I thought was be enormous and becoming infinite. These were the tools of individual liberation and empowerment. And it was objects that you found and recommended, but you were not stockpiling. It wasn't a catalog and that people ordered from you. You were kind of curating what an entire nation was creating, right? It was not trying to do anything other than let readers know what was the really good stuff. So there was an outfit in Sacramento that made really good teepees, for example, campus <laughs> teepees. And so yep. they were in there. There was a product that a woman could carry a baby that was completely fabric and easy to carry around that carried the baby right against her body called the Snuggly Baby Carrier. And there was another thing called a baby food grinder. And we put those guys on the map because they would send us the stuff. It was really good. And we would write it up in the whole catalog. And then suddenly they had a, a business. And the comparison with Google 35 years before it came along, I always interpreted that mm -hmm. as Steve basically saying, it was this crazy window on the world. It was this portal that allowed you to gaze into all this weird creativity that just wasn't going to show up on your doorstep otherwise. Because, I mean, I think of the media environment of the early 70s, there were probably three broadcast channels, your local newspaper and a national newspaper like the New York Times. And then all of a sudden, this compendium that a bunch of very focused people had spent a whole year pulling together just had to be fascinating. I think what the whole Earth Catalog really did, it does bear relation to Google, is that it conferred agency, mm. meaning it somehow encouraged people to realize that they could just learn how to build a guitar. There's a whole book on it. Yeah, They could get into making movies. There's a whole very good book. And in fact, there's a really good cinematographer's magazine. Then you could just learn anything that tells you how to write scripts and screenplays. And there was this access to skills. Yeah, People now come up to me and still, at least up there of a certain age, Basically, you're the lower horizon of that. <laughs> I was six, I think. But, uh, yeah. but man, my parents say, were. well, you know, I still have my whole earth catalog. And every now and then I ask why, and they look at me like I've just stepped on their toe. You know, what do you mean, why? I don't know. But I, people have kept it. And apparently it's some kind of thing that reminds them of a certain period of time, that yeah. it reflects for them sort of where they were, what they were doing, what they cared about in the 70s, mostly into the 80s. And then they say, well, you know, I got into so-and-so because of the whole Earth Catalog. And then they'll tell me their origin story. And what it is, is they had discovered, just by going through this collection of possibilities, is really what it was. And Google and the web does offer possibilities that way. I yeah. think especially YouTube videos confer agency like nothing else in life. And so Kevin Kelly tries to learn a new skill every so often. Ask him about this. He decided he wanted to learn how to weld. And so he just went online and looked at YouTube videos on how to weld. And by the time he was done, he was a pretty good welder. And he was making his own YouTube videos on how to weld. <laughs> he became a welding instructor. Well, I'm going to jump ahead very, very briefly just because you mentioned it. You're talking about the people who saved the whole Earth catalog. 
the folks listening would not have participated in this because A, it was before we started recording, and B, we are merely recording and not showing video. Although if they see this video that's being recorded, <laughs> they might see the moment before we started recording this piece, I asked you to sign the first copy of Wired, which mm -hmm. you were quite involved in. And I've had multiple people, as you saw, who were involved in that issue sign it. Mm -hmm. So that's another truly, truly iconic thing that piece of writing, piece of ongoing literature that you help bring into the world that some of us are still saving decades later. And another extremely influential thing you wrote, I'm going to quote you to you here right now, a wildly influential article in Rolling Stone magazine. And it opened with the words, this is you writing now, not Tom Wolfer, Steve Jobs, ready or not, computers are coming to the people. That's good news. Maybe the best news since psychedelics. Now, Writing something like that in 1982 shows such foresight. I mean, maybe 1% of American households had computers in 1982. The Macintosh wasn't even a glimmer in Steve Jobs' eyes. The IBM PC had been out for just a few months. It was flat out prophetic for 1982, but you wrote it in 1972. This was before the fax machine, the cassette tape, the CB radio, most American homes didn't have air conditioning yet. What did you see coming in 1972 when you wrote that, and how? So in 1972, I felt like I was late writing about this, because in 1961, 62 it must have been, after I got out of the Army, I was back at Stanford. Somebody was showing me around the computation center, as they called it at the time, and I heard squeals of glee from the back room. So I went into the back room and gathered around, I think it's a round screen of a, what was called a mini computer. It's kind of acting like a mainframe, probably a PDP-1, as it was called at the time, were three or four young software programmers thumbing away on some buttons and screaming at a screen where there was these extremely rudimentary big pixels, little spaceships, <laughs> shooting torpedoes at each other. And this was a game called Space War that had been developed at MIT just a few months before and then had spread around the various computation centers very quickly. It was a brilliant game. In the world's out. first computer game, perhaps? Very yeah. much the world's first computer game slash video game. And you saw this in 61. I saw it in 61. Whoa! And what I was seeing was creative young engineers out of their bodies and having more fun than I saw most people having on psychedelics. And so that was in my mind all the years of doing other things. And when I stopped the whole Earth catalog with the last catalog in 72, and Jan Wenner at Rolling Stone very kindly asked me to write something for Rolling Stone. I was flattered because Rolling Stone was the happening thing in San Francisco. And if you could write about anything, what would you like to write about? I said, well, I'd like to write about what people are getting up to with computers. Computers, <laughs> <laughs> what computers? But because I had been part of the so-called mother of all demos with Doug Engelbart a few years previously in the Fall Joint Computer Conference of 1968, 50 years ago, as we're speaking, I knew what was coming with computers. Could we go back to that 68 demo just to provide a little bit of context? Mm -hmm. Back in 67, come across... Doug Engelbart, with his whole concept of augmented human intellect, that he was HI, that he was pursuing at SRI. And Doug Engelbart was in the grip of a vision of the computer really being so easy to use that it basically become embedded as a tool in the way the humans would use it. And with his group at SRI, they were pushing that concept as far as the engineering could take, which was pretty darn far using you know, mainframe computer strength at the time. And they put together an hour, it was an hour and a half performance in San Francisco for the fall joint computer gathering of, I guess, a thousand plus people. I was brought in because I'd done the TRIPS Festival, sure. performance consultant or something like that. The demo was run in San Francisco, connected by a very sketchy microwave link to the computer at SRI in Palo Alto, 
30 miles away. Microwave, like a microwave tower or yeah, something like that? Yeah, they're putting out their own microwaves to do this. Did freshly cooked frozen dinners <laughs> drop from the sky as the beams were going? <laughs> there was no end of problems. But they knew the material well enough so that when glitches happened, they could fake around it. And it was basically an improvisational thing, even though we did rehearse it and so on. And what was he demonstrating? He was demonstrating the computer mouse, which he and Bill English invented. He was demonstrating interactive text writing. He was demonstrating files within files within files. He was demonstrating the ability to send files to other people so you could collaborate in real time at a distance or asynchronously at a distance. He was demoing what later became the World Wide Web in a sense. He was demoing the whole thing. You see the demo, just go online and Doug Engelbart or the mother of all demos, and you'll see this amazing performance. It was named by Saddam Hussein, I believe, the mother of all demos, right? <laughs> so I had been part of that, and I didn't think it was that big a deal because I wasn't in San Francisco. I was in the Menlo Park end where I occasionally get a cue from the guy who's in communication with Bill English up here in, in San Francisco. And it's time to shoot some film of the actual screen here. Now some film of somebody using the cord keyboard. Now some film of the setup here. And I was the guy behind the camera doing that. And that film would then be broadcast and part of this. Oh, you were capturing film that was going live up there to be part of it. Exactly. Wow. I was part of the demoing what was yeah. actually happening at the Menlo Park business end you know, the operational end of this. But at the end of it, it was kind of, you know, we're tapering down and things are getting quieter and we're looking around. Is it over? And just a minute, I'll check. The guy apparently called Bill English. Is it over? Yeah, it's over. Well, did they like it? Just a minute, I'll check. <laughs> well, what we didn't know is it was a standing ovation wow. that didn't stop. That it is people who are not only seeing a complete masterpiece, just doing more things simultaneously risking more things on the high wire without a net than you can possibly imagine in a demo simultaneously at the same time. Everything was hanging out there, and but they're showing marvels. Wow. So the risk, the showmanship of it, the presence of Doug on the stage, and marvel after marvel after marvel all nested together. People are not only seeing something amazing, they were seeing the future. Yeah. And it was a future they wanted to be part of. So they stood up and were applauding their guts out. And That's all of amazing. This, and screaming and carrying on. So our guy in Metal Park says, well, I talked to Bill. They liked it. <laughs> <laughs> and something that was perhaps as prefiguring of what much later became a fairly standard set of experiences on the World Wide Web and on the internet was the well. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the well, the whole <laughs> earth electronic link. When did you start it? A gentleman named Larry Brilliant, who had been part of the hog farm, had been, got his name changed to, when he was in India, hanging out with the same guru that lots of other people are hanging out with. And he was starting a entity in Michigan, near Ann Arbor, where he'd gone to school. They had a conferencing software called PicoSpan that he wanted me to do a whole earth catalog on. And he would put up money for that. And I didn't have any reason to say no. And I was kind of interested where personal computers were going because I'd written about all that. So that got me online. And then doing the catalog online, I realized it was not going to be a catalog. I wanted to do a conferencing system that was better than the commercial ones that were going on then called The Source and CompuServe. What year did you start it? This is 84, 85, and it's happening about the same time that Stephen Levy's book, Hackers, came out. And Kevin Kelly, who was then working at Whole Earth, had the idea of bringing together the three generations of hackers that Levy had written about in that book. So we hauled off and did that. And my wife, Ryan Phelan, whose name was then Patty Phelan, of course, she changed it to her middle name and didn't sound like a youthful female, she did the real organization, and Kevin and I found the people that would became the steering committee. So this was the first hacker conference? It really was ever. the first ever hackers conference by far. Did it say from the people who brought you the Crips <laughs> Festival? No, <on>? nothing like <laughs> that. That would have been funny. So we had Steve Wozniak, he was part of it. Andy Hertzfeld was part of it. And an amazing array of people who were either famous or became famous with their computer skills, spending three gleeful days and nights just cavorting. 
one of the big deals was piracy because software is so easy to copy. People were basically buying one and selling many <laughs> of commercial software, which was pissing off the people who were making the commercial software, which led to the conversation that Wozniak and I had that led to me saying information wants to be expensive and information wants to be free because it's so easy to copy. And then that became one of the sort of slogans of the period. Well, so you're they then. Because everybody always says, well, they say information wants to be free. I've always wondered who they was. So yep. you're the first person who said that. But it's interesting that part of the quote was it also wants to be expensive. Yep. That's really significant because the part that everybody repeats mm -hmm. is information wants to be free. Well, that was the news because in a way, all information handling up till then, apart from sort of telephone conversations and person-to-person -person conversations, People were figuring out ways to monetize. Well, it had been expensive previously because it had to come in some kind of a physical vessel, which cost real money to manufacture and to distribute. And because it was a physical vessel, it went through a tight aperture because there's only so much shelf space or there's only so many channels. And so I think that in the 80s, we all confused mm -hmm. the expense of information mm -hmm. for information being inherently expensive. And I think it was even in the 90s, still a revelation to people that, oh my God, that's just a relic right. of this physical architecture. Wow, that is really interesting. I did not know you were they in that particular case. Well, I was noticing, and you rightly, and I had not thought this through, called out that the thing that was easy to monetize was the means of communication, the book, the magazine, or whatever it may be. And you could charge an extra toll for the tightness of the distribution aperture that it came through. Right. Because that was the really expensive thing. And yeah. that was the scarce medium that you run economics with. Yeah. But the threshold, because of the ease of digital copying and increasingly digital broadcast, basically took that thing down to zero. Yeah. And that was why people were able to pirate software. And all these piracy prevention things went into place, which people hated because it made everything impossible. So that was the discussion that was going on. So that was a conversation you had with Waz at the first ever Hackers Conference. Right. That was videoed at the time. And oh, good. The Getty Archive has that piece of video where oh, we're having that little back and forth. So anyway, the Hackers Conference is going on. We're working up on how did the well come about. So freelance, lone samurai programmers were clustering around whole earth anyway. Access to tools was their approach to life. The Hackers Conference brought in more of them. And then the setting in motion and online conferencing system that we were going to call the well was also bringing them in. And the AOL was just being founded around that time, right? Or a little yes. after? Yes. And in fact, at one point, Steve Case came and visited with us sort of to figure out what our secret sauce was and go off and make it work for him. One thing I knew was that anonymity is lethal. And this is a lesson we're still learning. Boy, are we. So was the anonymity not something that happened on the well? Correct. Because we had your credit card number, we had your actual identity. At any time, you could find the real person behind any comment that you read online. And we had flame wars. We had all the usual nasty stuff that happens. But by having that ability to identify people, not having bots, not having people pretending successfully to be people they were not, it was less pathogenic than yeah, yeah. many online systems have become. But it's still pathogenic. And I only stayed on the well for two or three years because at one point, we had a new board and the board wanted to do something or other and some of the staff thought it was a bad idea and they sort of invoked the community to inveigh against what the board wanted to do. I started getting excoriated in an organized fashion. <laughs> excoriated in an organized fashion. That's a good way of putting it. And it was yeah. a classic pile on. It was, uh, you know, get a little blood from the chicken and everybody would join in and pick the chicken to death. I'd seen that happen to a few other people and suddenly it was happening to me. And my hands are shaking as I'm trying to write a reply that will take the sting out of what's going on. Yeah. And I realized there is no way out. Yeah. So I quit. I quit the well, quit the board. I got it off the well. Because of the toxicity. Because of that toxicity. Both yeah. Kevin Kelly and I sort of realized there is an inherent problem here. Wow. That is profound. Well, I hate to fast forward through a 20-year-ish period, roughly, particularly as it includes 
your work in helping to create Wired Magazine in the 90s, which we've talked about, what's probably your most influential book as opposed to Catalog, How Buildings Learn, your work in co-founding GBN, Mm -hmm. Global Business Network, which pioneered the use of scenario planning in the private sector, founding MTV, founding Disneyland. No, you didn't do those things. did a lot of other things. I'm joking. (laughs) Um, He's joking, people. I'm joking about the last two. But I want to get to the long now and de-extinction. So Mm -hmm. let's jump way ahead. Long now. Mm Mm-hmm. What's its philosophy? What's its goals? And how did you start this thing? It started, I was at the Media Lab in 1987 at MIT and wound up doing a book called The Media Lab, Inventing the Future at MIT. The other thing that came out of the Media Lab was becoming acquainted with Danny Hillis. Danny Hillis had started a company just down the street from the Media Lab in Boston, in Cambridge on the river, called Thinking Machines. And he was in the process of inventing what became massive parallel processing. And so I interviewed him for that. About that, that became a chapter in the book. And then I was paying attention to him as we got into the 90s. He sent out an email to everybody that he knew, 94 or something like that, saying, I find it strange that all my life people have been talking about the year 2000 as the future. Here we are into the early 90s, and they're still talking about year 2000 is the future. The future has been getting shorter by one year per year (laughs) for my entire (laughs) life. There are increasingly going to be problems with this. (laughs) So Danny was treating this as a design problem. What he wanted to do as an engineer to solve the problem of people thinking the year 2000 is the future was to build a clock. And this clock would, he said, tick once a year, bong once a century, and every thousand years the cuckoo comes out. (laughs) And he says, think Stonehenge scale, and that this is a clock which takes thousands of years seriously and ideally reframes your thinking out of the year 2000 or the end of this decade or more long term. Let's talk about 2030 or 2050. Is the, you know, come on. So he sent that out to all his friends, and apparently none of them responded except me. And I wrote back and said, basically, let's do it. And do what? Build your clock. Build our clock. <laughs> and Jeff Bezos was one of your first. No, Jeff came along came later. later. Yes. Yeah. Became real friends with Danny Hillis and Alexander Rose. And we acquired, thanks to Mitch Kapor and others, a site in eastern Nevada that looked like a great mountain site for the clock. Jeff came there twice, visited, thought about it. And then the reason that a clock is now being built in a mountain, it's not in eastern Nevada, it's in western Texas, basically at the site where. Jeff Bezos owns most of a county that includes a whole mountain range, the Diablo Mountains. And in one of those mountains, we are now building this 300-foot-high clock. Designed to last how many years? Is it 10,000 years? We say 10,000, but it's sort of minimum 10,000. It should go multiples beyond that. And it can survive outages of traditional power, absence of traditional mechanics. I'm just thinking of all the things Mm -hmm. you need to think about when you're designing something to last for 10,000 years or more. Yeah. It's meant to be a working Stonehenge in a way. Yeah. Imagine going to Mars and you know, only finding there's a device because there was a civilization there, but the device is working. Yeah. <laughs> that level of reach turns out to be completely plausible. Underground is a safe place for things. We did the research of where should the clock be and doing a serious industrial design of what should the materials be, what should the actual design be. It needs to be a skeleton clock in the sense that you can look at it like a steam engine and understand how it works. And if it's broken, understand what needs to be done to fix it, things like that. Materials, that all the surfaces that rub on one another, they need to be ones that don't need lubricant because then that becomes its own problem when the lubricant dries up or Or runs out. Yeah. Yeah. So you want ceramic surfaces for certain kinds of rubbing mechanisms and in a certain scale, the design principle, everything is played out in the design of the clock so that no electricity is involved whatsoever except maybe electricity in the batteries of the flashlights that people carry when they go inside the mountain. Yeah. But that ain't Uh, part of the clock. Yeah. That ain't part of the clock. It's entirely mechanical. And it has a new kind of pendulum that Danny invented that is more efficient than a Huygens pendulum. It's a sort of pendulum that's above and below the pivot and ticks very, very slowly. So when you're inside the clock, you'll hear a very infrequent tick. Wow. But it's just frequent enough so that you realize it's a tick, not a random noise. I was talking to Danny not long ago. Didn't he invent a new kind of bell? 
Like, wasn't there some yeah. issue that the bell could only be made so big, but he did some crazy math and figured out if you hit a harmonic with it, you could get something that's twice as deep as you would expect from a bell that had half the metal. Mm -hmm. And he literally put it out to bed at the company that made the Liberty Bell and Big Ben. I mean, people have been making bells for a while now, and Danny figured this thing out. This is a collaboration of Danny Hillis and Brian Eno. Brian Eno was part of the founding board of the Long Now Foundation. He named the Long Now. And so Brian has been inventing various kinds of bell sounds, chime sounds, electronically, and figuring out how they could be made out of glass or various other things for this amazingly deep-sounding small bell that Danny designed. I think there's an Australian bell maker. When do you expect to open the clock? We're very careful never to try to specify the date because what Danny keeps saying is that basically when you designed a deadline, you take the first good enough solution. On the other hand, I've just been reading about Leonardo da Vinci and the Mona Lisa was a work in progress when he died after 30 years. He was wow. still adding brush strokes to the Mona Lisa. Wow. And that's one of the reasons it's as good as it is. Yeah. Wouldn't it be funny if he was trying to do that Rothko thing that's just a black canvas? And that's, <laughs> yeah, it was he was direction. on his way to that. And, and thank God he passed away when he did because it was at this really cool moment. <laughs> Could well be. So no announced time frame on the clock. But, you know, it's far along. The construction of the clock is basically done. And installation of the clock is underway as we speak. Wow. When people will be able to visit the clock, finishing goes on for a long time in any ambitious undertaking. The trails are sketchy. The trails are dangerous. The trails have got to be done because the way you visit the clock is basically a day to get to that part of Texas. And then you're going to get up very early in the morning, walk up serious miles and altitude of trail get to a hole in the bottom of a cliff, go in through the hole in the bottom of the cliff and into darkness. A world of darkness. Clockness. Clockness. Big tick sounds. Wow. At noon, the chimes going off and the chimes that the 10 bell peals that day will be unique to that day. They'll never be rung again. They'll that... never be rung again in that peal. I that... think I detect Brian's influence there. Yeah, am I there's right? a Brian and Danny algorithm playing out there that's all mechanically done. And all the computation is mechanically done. So every day, a unique never again in the 10,000 year thing, of course it's mechanically done because we just talked about how there is no electricity, there's no computation, or at least there's no digital computation. That is wild. Okay, so now what keeps the clock ticking is up on top of the mountain, there's a diaphragm, a bellows, which it gets cold at night in the desert, hot during the day, the sun shines on the thing. Cold, hot, cold, hot. That's a fair amount of pressure, which goes down and feeds the escapement to keep the big old pendulum going. So it'll tick. It'll always know what time it is. And then there's a corrective because, you know, the rotation of the earth is going to slow down and various things, the equinox is moving and all the rest of the procession of the equinoxes happens over 26,000 years, of right. which 10 a is a large year. fraction. All the corrections happen so that, among other things, at noon, a ray of sunlight on a sunny day comes in through a lens, focuses on a thing, which sets the clock to solar noon that day. And without any kind of digital electronics, the clock, Denny has created a sensor that will allow that calibration to happen in a physical manner. Bingo. Because if you can think of a thousand ways to implement that in code or electronics, that ray of sun coming in resets to solar noon every day. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's nuts. Now, the public-facing side of the Long Now here in San Francisco is a wonderful monthly lecture series, mm -hmm. an equally wonderful cafe slash bar called the Interval Cafe, where, as you know, I did a lot of my writing and also set a couple of pivotal scenes of my last novel. And I love the work that you guys do because it's kind of like this really long, slow TED conference. Mm -hmm in that the talks are very long compared to TED Talks, which tend to be 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. TED Talks will be five in a session. You're five in a five-month span of time. Mm -hmm. But I think it does a great service, certainly for the San Francisco community. I mean, you sell out those shows. There's 600 people and every single thing that you put on, and then you put them mm -hmm. up on the web, and God knows how many thousands of people convene and hear We're them. We're getting well over a million downloads a year. That's phenomenal. Both the podcast audio version yep. and the very well- edited video versions. Yep. So it is kind of long form TED yeah. in the sense that 
we encourage the speaker to think about the enormous online audience as well as the very lively, long-term thinking, present, real audience. Now, speaking of TED, I think you announced what might be your single most ambitious project at TED. I think it's about five years ago with the words, extinction is a different kind of death. It's bigger. Can we talk briefly about Revive and Restore <laughs> sure, and the De-Extinction the, Project? We have the rest of our lives to talk about this one because in a way, de-extinction is going to be a slow process. We are over five years old since that TED Talk. De-extinction begun by focusing on things like the passenger pigeon, the great auk, and moved on to the woolly mammoth especially. I get to go to Pleistocene Park this summer with George Church. Oh, really? And Alexander Rose and Markoff and others. Well, I think, you know, George was a guest on this show a few episodes back, and we talked a little bit about this, but I knew that you and I would be talking, so he and I focused more on things like xenotransplantation, which is a word that always makes me feel smart whenever I hear myself saying it. So could we talk through one of the species that you guys are working with as an example? I think a more interesting one would be one of the genetic rescue projects. So thank Thanks to Chris Anderson at TED, who put up $200,000 to start Revive and Restore, basically. And by then, we were friends with National Geographic, who had sponsored the first meeting of various scientists interested in de-extinction. But there was one guy there from named Seth Willey, who was from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife. So he got in touch with us and said, with this technology you're talking about, the genetic engineering technology be of any use to the most endangered mammal in North America. Well, what's that? Well, it's the black-footed ferret. Black-footed ferret is this adorable-looking, quite vicious-tempered little creature, sort of the size of a squirrel, who feeds on prairie dogs, almost solely. Predators, they're obligate to a particular prey. If that prey goes away, they go away. Prairie dogs have been fought by ranchers. Oh, right, yeah. In the short grass prairie the whole Western prairie in North America for a very long time. You kill off the prairie dogs, you kill off the the black-footed ferrets. It was thought they'd gone extinct. Then they found a few. They all died. And they thought, okay, they're really extinct now. Then they found one more bunch, and they captured 20-some animals, seven of which reproduced. They've been, for 30 years, raising them in captive breeding, and there have been now thousands of kits of young black-footed ferrets born. But from just seven founders, you start to get inbreeding issues yeah. over the generations. It turns out that the San Diego Frozen Zoo cryopreserves tissues from black hooded ferrets that were not part of the seven founders. Tell us what the San Diego Frozen Zoo is. That is a place where thousands of species have been cryopreserved, which means that in a way that not only is it like the DNA is so intact that you can read it, the cells are viable. The DNA is viable. And they've been doing this cryopreservation for how long? Over 30 years. So, okay, yeah. And they got in terrible trouble years ago, the same kind of trouble we now get in. Turns out there's this concept called moral hazard. And whenever you hear the word moral hazard, somebody is about to make a stupid excuse to say no. <laughs> and the moral hazard idea is, oh my gosh, if people think they can bring species back from extinction because they've been frozen or because they've been de-extincted. They'll be reckless about preserving. They'll be reckless. Yeah. And they will let them go extinct. That's why we shouldn't have seat belts. And that, yeah, bingo. That's why well, we you shouldn't should have... wear helmets. Why you... are you so far ahead on this? <laughs> I was just joking with is that. Is this a science fiction thing? How come you know so much about moral hazard? <laughs> You're kind to say that. No, I just jumped to that as sort of an absurdist rebuttal. Most people don't make that jump, and it's exactly the same argument, that seat belts will make people drive carelessly. Which is inherently a preposterous argument to make, obviously, because they save so many lives. Ergo, the argument itself is just inherently preposterous. That was my thinking. Bravo. Well, thank you. Spread the word on that because it keeps coming up. Anyway, the people who started the frozen zoo at San Diego years ago got in trouble with conservationists saying, moral hazard is going to make people careless. Don't do it. It's an easy out. We don't want those techno fixes, right? We're doing this the hard way. Yeah, let's do it the hard way. Thanks to them having done it, there is living viable, restorable cell lines. Not from the seven founding ferrets. Not the from the seven founding, founding ferrets. ferrets. That's right. a funny phrase. <laughs> it should have been the 50 founding ferrets or the five founding ferrets. Seven Eves book by Neil Stevenson. Yeah. Guess where that seven came from? Oh, the seven founding ferrets. The seven founding ferrets. It really is good that it's not five founding <laughs> ferrets because if that would sound better, there'd be two fewer ferrets. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I'm just gonna go, getting a little punchy. Okay, yeah. so there's at least two cell lines that have been investigated, thanks to us, at the San Diego Zoo. 
And we are now working up in the process of cloning those two animals back to life. What? Now, they will be twins of, course, of the yeah. original, but basically genetically identical, perfectly recognizable little black-footed ferrets. So it's advantageous in the sense that instead of seven founders, they're now basically nine founders. The other thing is it's from 30 years ago. So instead of six or seven generations later of accumulating of the deleterious genes, which happens within breeding, they are clean of that collection of deleterious genes. And that's just the start. Wait, wait, there's more. Wait, wait, there's more. It turns out, we didn't learn this until we went to the Fort Collins Blackfooted Ferret Center, where these animals are in captive breeding. They're also in several zoos. And they said, well, you know, we keep releasing them to the wild. And every wet season, sylvatic plague wipes them out. There's an introduced disease, which is riding on the native fleas, and they die. You can lose all of them from a colony that you've reintroduced to the wild. So are they going to go extinct again? Might be the case. Unless... Not unless they release them all at one time and get rid of their breeding program. They're not going to... Well, gonna... you know, how long... This is an expensive breeding program. Yeah. How long do you want to keep maintaining these cute but vicious animals that don't actually get to be restored to the wild? And yeah. Curiosity of high expense. By the way, that would be a great title for a book. A Curiosity of High Expense. Yeah. If somebody ever writes about the founding ferrets. I love talking to writers because you think things and run with them. <laughs> so, suppose you could engineer, genetically engineer, ferrets that are resistant instead of susceptible to the disease. Well, there already are ferrets that are resistant to the disease. They're called domestic ferrets. So, do a bit of research, find out you know, what's the differences between them, look for maybe in the histocompatibility complex or something like that, differences that might affect the resistance that could be identified edited, written, and moved into the genome of black-footed ferrets. And there's a fair amount of ferrets that have been collected from their entire range, north to south, which is from Canada to Mexico, basically. They're in museums. And in those skins, black-footed ferret skins is DNA that can be sequenced. They haven't been cryopreserved, but the skins should have intact DNA. Yeah, to get the detailed sequencing of some of the ones that have been in museums for 100 years or whatever. Those will show some variability that used to be in the black-footed ferret genome that is not there now. And so we should be able, over the next decades, identify and then bring back into the living population genes that are extinct in the living population but can be extracted from the museum population. Right. And these living animals will basically breed with their long-dead ancestors. And then you've got genetically a self-managing population back in the wild. They're not being done in by the disease. They have the genetic variability to do adaptation on their own. Yeah. And you can say, welcome back. You're making the short grass prairie much more exciting and rich than it used to be. And what's the next animal? And so George Church has been the leader of actually editing extinct genes into living, in this case, elephant, Asian elephant cell lines. Yep. And they've identified 16, and they keep identifying more specific genes in the woolly mammoth genome, which has been well sequenced, that have to do with basically cold capability. And so there's things like long woolly hair, which is red. There's things like subcutaneous fat, six centimeters, because it's a six long cold winter. Six centimeters, wow. There's things like blood that is adapted to stay warm all the way out to the extremities. There's things like temperature insensitivity, so they're not shivering themselves to death. And uh, 16 of those have been studied, written, and introduced as written genes into living elephant cell line. Asian elephants. That, Asian elephants, which are closer than African elephants. Yeah. Very close. In so fact. they're bringing woolly mammoth attributes into the Asian elephants. Bingo. And that has gotten as far as the cell line. Once you've got the cell lines, then you can move in the direction of embryos. Once you've got embryos, you can either implant that in a Asian elephant surrogate mother, or what George wants to do, and I think correctly, is rather than endanger elephant, Pregnancy is tricky for mammals anyway. <laughs> and it's a 22-month gestation cycle with an elephant. So. Yeah, so 22 months is a long time to wait. And if it's a failure, it's a long-term expensive failure. Yeah, and you've also harmed that elephant's ability to make more Asian elephants who are not hyper like that. You're, you're not really delighted to do that. Besides, the goal here is not to have one or two woolly mammoths in zoos. The goal is to have hundreds of thousands of woolly mammoths back in the mammoth steppe, recreating the mammoth steppe. 
George wants yeah. to edit these mammoths back into existence. He wants to gestate them in essentially Brave New World style factory, right? In an artificial universe. Yeah, that's yeah. wild. And which makes a lot of sense. And he and I actually did talk about this briefly in the interview, oh, and I found it fascinating because you think about ex utero gestation, and I think about, well, eggs. Mm -hmm. Mammals don't really do eggs, so we don't really have that kind of a gear. But he was talking about moving at it from two different directions. Like there's a certain amount of stuff that is rather egg-like in the very early development, even of a mammalian body. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so you sort of push that, but you also come from the other side. Well, we can get a preemie mm -hmm. and we can rescue a preemie who comes out months early. So what mm -hmm. do we do there? Well, obviously we can handle a few months on this end and a few months on that end. Mm -hmm. And eventually you want to have the meat in the middle. If you were a betting man, when do you think the first full-fledged woolly mammoth would pop out of its ex vivo uterus? Is that something that's on the five-year horizon, the 10-year horizon? If we had tens of millions of dollars, we could bring back the woolly mammoth now, start doing it trait by trait. The thing I think will happen is, you know, we'll move ahead with 16, 23, 47, whatever is genes that make a more and more mammoth-like creature. You probably won't do the big curly tusks right away because yeah. you don't need that really to survive in the north. The point is to get them there in a self-managing scale population, which means herds. And them being uh, cold adapted Asian elephants on their way to being woolly mammoths in the first Yeah, initially. they're woolly. Yeah. <laughs> that are fine with the cold. And so returning to the Pleistocene Park theme, explain why this would be so valuable from a conservation and a global warming standpoint to have vast herds of these vast critters stomping around up there. The whole world used to be like the Serengeti in Africa. The whole world used to have large quantities of large animals on it. And there were big carnivores feeding on very big grazers, and that was the world. So when you go on safari in Africa, Okavango Delta or wherever, and see the hippopotamuses and the giraffes and the wildebeests and the various kinds of antelope and the cheetahs that are chasing them and the lions and the hyenas and all of this, the whole world was like that until people showed up. The only reason they're still in Africa is that people and those animals evolved together. It used to be like that in Australia. It used to be like that in North America, South America. There were giant ground sloths. There were mastodons and then later mammoths and, 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 and. The far north was like that as well. The mammoth steppe was like the Mara in Kenya. It was teeming with 100x animal biomass on the landscape. And they were big. The cave bear, which is, you know, the big old bear. You had woolly rhinoceros closely related to the Sumatran rhinoceros. You had woolly mammoths. You had a different kind of reindeer. You had Kudian horses. You had muskox. You had bison. And it was teeming. It was a grazed landscape. Now, I want that kind of bioabundance back everywhere in the world. I want the big animals back. And I think it's doable. It'll and the big animals are vital. They are. And sort of apex predators and all this kind of language. It's a much richer ecosystem, Oz, if you have the large animals there. Nature is not broken and it's not even fragile. So in the absence of large animals, nature carries on with smaller animals. It's fine. We'll be okay. But it's better with the big animals. And the far north, where people mostly don't want to go, it was called the Mammoth Steppe. It was the world's largest biome. When we killed off the large animals of the north, which is understandable, it's cold, you're hungry, you get a lot more food from one woolly rhinoceros or one woolly mammoth than you do from X number of rabbits. And they're a lot easier to get. Or black ferrets. Yeah, or yeah. black ferrets, which were never eaten by humans. <laughs> when those animals were extincted by us, that grassland stopped being grassland. Grass requires grazers. Grass and grazers come together. You lose the grazers, you lose the grass. Tundra comes in and boreal forest comes in. In climate terms, a boreal forest is not as reflective when there's snow, obviously, it's much more absorptive of sunlight. And the thick snow that develops becomes a problem because the cold of winter can't get really down into the permafrost as much. The thick snow acts as an insulator. It's an insulator. When the animals were there, they were treading it down to where it was thin and the cold got really down and the permafrost stayed permanent. Tundra, which is largely replaced the grass, 
is melting now because of global warming and releasing no end of greenhouse gases, both CO2 and methane, into the atmosphere. As it thaws out. As it keeps thawing out. There's gigatons and gigatons of CO2 and methane fixed in that permafrost under the tundra. And unfortunately, not fixed as it keeps thawing. So it's accelerating climate change. Grasslands fix carbon. Tundra, under the circumstances, releases carbon dioxide. So if you get the grasslands back, with or without the woolly mammoth, that's the Pleistocene Park scheme. Is getting the grasslands. Getting the grasslands. Once you have a density of grazers enough, which is what they've done in the 25 square miles that I'll be going to visit in August, then you get grass instead of tundra. Now, as Sergei Zimov, the lead scientist there, says, we can knock down the trees with surplus tanks, that military tanks that they have. So the hope is that when you get the grazers, including the woolly mammoths, can knock down the trees. And Sergei Zimov's line is, uh, I can use tanks, but they make no dung. <laughs> it's true. And making <laughs> dung is a huge part of what keeps the whole grazer grazing thing going. Right. They move nutrients around, they improve nutrients, all this kind of thing. Mammoths are part of the picture is the kind of, to my eye, bioabundance that the earth deserves back and can get back. In terms of climate, it's not going to fix climate. One, it'll take way too long. But what getting the grasslands back in the far north would do will really help enable climate stabilization over the long term, which is, we're talking about centuries here, moving on into millennia. And the kind of bioabundance that would be 100x more creatures animals, biomass on the land in that largest of biomes in the world. It's a big event. Yeah. And is the kind of Earth National Park that in a way we would like civilization to eventually be living in. And so the role, the job that the woolly mammoth or the cold tolerant Asian elephant or its job is knocking down some of this arboreal forest in the way Mm -hmm. that the elephants do. Mm -hmm. Knocking down the arboreal forest lets the cold seep in. Mm -hmm. It lets the tundra get replaced by grass, Mm -hmm. which is fixing CO2 instead of releasing methane. Mm -hmm. And unlike a tank, they're (laughs) pooping everywhere. They're pooping in huge, huge, steaming masses. Mammoth, Mammoth, we could say. I mean, if if you've ever seen elephant poop in the wild, it's an event. <laughs> yeah. Well, the thing is, there's a movie about woolly mammoths being made. Oh, or really? woolly. Based on and, the Ben Mesrick book? Or? Yeah, based on the Ben Mesrick book, which if we had the money that is being spent in that movie to bring back woolly mammoths, we could bring back woolly mammoths. Good God. That's hysterical in a bad way. <laughs> um, just to close, you wrote my favorite book on ecology and environmentalism several years ago called Whole Earth Discipline. Mm-hmm. And in it, you expanded on an article that was very influential that you wrote in Technology Review called Mm. The Four Heresies Mm -hmm. of Environmentalism. So the term I've been promoting is eco-pragmatism. And just to look at any conservation problem, any environmental problem, any climate problem, and set the narratives that keep you excited and going aside for a minute, set the ideology that you find persuasive aside for a goddamn minute and just think like an engineer. Where an engineer looks at a problem and all they're thinking about is how do I solve this problem? The clarity of that is, I think, what is needed with not all environmental problems, but many environmental problems that have been resistant to traditional approaches. Or traditional approaches were really good, but not good enough to complete the job. And so, like with the black-footed ferret, captive breeding has done wonders for keeping them alive and going and being reintroduced to the wild. But they can't prosper there because of issues that cannot be solved by captive breeding alone, not be solved by protecting their habitat alone. It needs something else. And engineers that are widely based and thinking broadly are looking around for whatever tool comes to hand that does not itself cause harm from whatever source that can help solve the problem. And so genetic engineering seemed to come from corporations for a long time in agriculture, should not poison that technology for being used by nonprofits, which we are, and other people working also in agriculture are, to make the right thing happen with food crops, to make the right thing happen with wild creatures and plants, forests, and so on. They need genetic help. And Also, you want to look at the reality. There was a fantasy in the 60s, back to the land, back to basics, 
that imagine the cities as the root of all evil and the countryside as the root of all virtue. Now, all of us who actually tried to do communes nearly died of boredom. <laughs> and in some cases, starvation, from what I've heard. And in some cases, starvation, because it's hard to live in the country. Subsistence farming is really, really hard. And it's not so good for Mother Earth, right? It's not so good for Mother Earth. It's not so much fun. And we were easily bored. We were bored. And we fled back to town where things are not so boring. But even so, the environmental movement kept acting like cities were the problem. I think cities are the solution. They certainly have been the solution to the population bomb. They diffused it entirely. They get people more concentrated. Concentration where you can take the diffused pressure of humanity off the natural landscape is always a good thing to do. It's why nuclear is better than wind or grid scale solar because the farms of wind farms are industrializing the landscape. Big solar farms like at Ivanpah are not just frying birds that fly by. They're destroying that particular desert and the desert tortoises that live there and so on. More concentrated forms of energy have been the fossil fuels. Well, we've got to lay off of that because of climate change. So what else is a nice concentrated form of energy? Well, nuclear. Better than fossil fuels in every respect. Doesn't put all this crap in the air that burning coal does. Has a couple of issues with radiation, which are very well understood. Has a couple of issues with storage, which are very well understood. And the density of the of the stored material is so strong that Nuclear France keeps all of their waste in an area the size of a basketball court. Really? Yeah. Then geoengineering is straightforward by time. And I like David Keith, who's worth talking to in your sequence here. David Keith at Harvard got some money from Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to look into the practicality of doing geoengineering in a non-frightening way, which is increment by increment. And for those who don't know, geoengineering basically means trying to create different conditions, particularly in the atmosphere, that would mm. make the atmosphere more reflective, thereby counteracting the greenhouse effect of CO2 and methane and so forth, attaining higher concentrations, roughly. That's one form of geoengineering. Geoengineering is basically direct intervention in the climate. And what you just described is called solar geoengineering, and it is trying to reduce the absorption of sunlight by making the Earth more reflective. And one of the ways of doing that is putting particles in the stratosphere way the hell up there. It doesn't yep. take a lot of particles to add to the reflectiveness. And you can slow the heating of the planet down considerably at minimal cost, a couple billion a year, and you can slow the heating down. Now, there's some things you don't fix. The extra CO2 is adding to acidification in the oceans. On the other hand, the extra CO2 so far is being welcomed by the plants. So the plants of the world are much more prosperous now with this extra CO2. They like that. Primary production of plants all over the world has gone up. Yeah, I think you had a statistic in the book, the total number of green biomass is up mm. by something like 19% over 15 or 20 years. Bingo. And that term primary production, I thought was a great one just to explain it. That means green mass that didn't used to exist, it's basically made of CO2 and water. Right. So if you have another thousand pounds of plants tomorrow they didn't have today, quote unquote primary production, those plants are in significant part made of CO2. Right. So it's just gone from the air. So in that very fundamental sense, with climate change so far, there is more life. It's not necessarily the life you want, but it is, in fact, more life. Going and thank on. God it's taking some CO2 out of the air while it's at it. So yeah. the great thing about climate is it's introducing people to complexity. Yeah. And simple solutions don't work because the problems aren't simple. But a whole portfolio of things that you do simultaneously is what a responsible, we are as gods, set yeah. of gods would do at the planetary scale. And this is the thing that started with those photographs of the Earth, is we started thinking of the planet as a planet that needs its gardening at a very large scale. Yeah. You know, where it does most of the work, but you tweak a few things so that it is, does it in a way which is not only congenial for human life, but it's congenial for all life. And a less erratic climate, like it's been for the last 10,000 years while civilization was taking shape, Civilization would be happiest and nature would be happiest if we could actually keep a relatively stable climate over the next 10,000 years. And that's doable. And geoengineering is hopefully a temporary fix while we get the greenhouse gases back to effectively zero, which is doable with certainly with fission, with nuclear power, ideally with fusion, if we can ever finally figure out how to make fusion really, really work. 
which could well happen. And then we're trying to figure out how to do air capture of carbon straight from the atmosphere, the carbon dioxide. I think there's genetic things that could be done with microbes, maybe in the oceans, maybe in some bodies of water, where there's biological fixing that could be done. Because in a way, plants are fixing, as you just pointed out, carbon dioxide all the time. They turn it into plant matter. And it goes in the ground and then cycles and it goes back out as carbon dioxide and methane. Well, what if there's ways using biology, since this is mostly a biological system we're talking about, to air capture and fix in a permanent way a carbon dioxide where it's not getting back to the atmosphere? I'm guessing that that is probably one of the ways that geoengineering is going to happen. And I think this century, bottom line, is on the way to becoming incredibly green. It will be the first time humanity has solved a humanity scale, a planet scale problem. We've never done that before. You could say we did it by not having a nuclear exchange, but that was really just two governments duking it out basically in secret behind the scenes with all of us being afraid. And we're still kind of in the woods as well. Eh, A little bit. A little bit, yeah. Yeah, you could have two bombs go back and forth and that would be quite terrible and everybody would you know, hate it a lot, yeah. but it would be like 9-11 in the sense it would change how we think about things, but it would not actually do that much damage. It would maybe make us more cautious about things we need to be more cautious about. But climate change is not like that. Climate change is not a sudden event. It's not a thing that is caused by governments. It's not a thing that's going to be solved just by governments. It's solved by basically everybody deciding, we caused it, we got to fix it. Everybody, all together, whole goddamn civilization, of the whole goddamn planet. And Thinking as a planet is what climate change is forcing us to do. Thinking as a civilization rather than just a society or a nation, but as a civilization. People in this century get to live in a century where humanity discovers itself as the keeper of life now on a whole planet. What an amazing realization, what an amazing job, what an amazing thing to work out, how that actually works. But all the tools are in place to do that, to make it. Earth National Park and the city that you want to live in and the society that continues to become ever more amazing from year to year and decade to decade in a non-destructive way. What's going to happen in this century? Well, I love the optimism, or let me just call it realism, because I'd rather believe it's realism than optimism. That's a beautiful picture you just painted. Thank you so much for spending so much of your afternoon with me going into the early evening. This has been a fantastic conversation. Well, thank you, Rob. It's a great pleasure. I delighted in every minute of that interview, but particularly Stuart's crescendo of optimism at the end about all that he expects humanity to achieve in this century. As he spoke, golden light was flooding into my living room from the West. Stuart's biographers were filming every moment, but fun and atmospheric as those elements were, They briefly vanished for me as Stuart shared his summation about where he sees our species now, some 50 years after we first beheld the whole Earth set against the black vacuum of space. I'm going to close with one of my favorite stories, not just one of my favorite Stuart stories, but from the full sweep of my own life. As briefly mentioned in the interview, the great American author Tom Wolfe passed away shortly before Stuart and I sat down. He was one of the true lions of modern American literature and had an immense influence on me, not only as a writer, but on my very decision to become one in the first place. My favorite book of Wolf's has always been The Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test, which opens with the mad scene I read from of Stuart chauffeuring the author into San Francisco. As I mentioned at the start of the episode, Stuart and I traveled to Cuba with his wife and several friends not long ago. As it happened, the publishing house Tashin released a lavish 50th anniversary edition of the Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test right before we left. If you're not familiar with Tashin, I urge you to correct this immediately. They release some of the most lovingly crafted books on the planet, which include art books, photo-rich books on all manner of topics, and occasionally fresh editions of important works. Many Tashin releases cost thousands of dollars, and though I've found many of their books to be unaffordable over the years, I've never considered any to be overpriced. The Tashin edition of the Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test includes hundreds of photos of Ken Kesey and his merry band at the height of their powers, and many of those photos feature Stuart. Since it was reasonably affordable for a Tashin book, and since Stuart's birthday would occur while we were all in Cuba, 
I was seriously considering buying him a copy of that thing. The matter was settled when I received an email announcing that Tom Wolfe himself would be at the special edition's release party, which, as it happened, would be held in Greenwich Village, a short walk from our apartment, and, as it happened, would be held the night before our departure for Cuba. Best of all, I was actually invited to this private event on account of having overspent pretty recklessly on Tashin products throughout the previous year. And so I went, eager to meet or at least lay eyes on my hero Tom Wolfe and to perhaps score an autographed edition of the tome, which may have featured the first instance of the name Stuart Brand in print. It was a capacity crowd, and Mr. Wolfe was resplendent in his trademark white linen suit and an exquisitely carved fox-headed cane, which showed that even the medical accessories of the elderly can be dapper. As he did a reading and made some comments, I was dismayed when the MC announced at the end that books would not be signed that evening. But I figured I had nothing to lose, so I went up to one of the organizers and asked her to tell Mr. Wolf that someone in the crowd was heading to Havana with Stuart Brand the next day and was hoping to bring along an autographed copy. This was taken under consideration. And about 20 minutes later, an usher gave me the hope for signal to join Mr. Wolf in the backstage room to which he had repaired. I walked in, he stood up and gave me a stern look that I could tell was playful and said, are you the one who's about to leave the country for Cuba with Stuart Brand? I said that I was. He raised his finger in an almost Gandalf-like way and said, you must be a very interesting young man. Then he signed Stuart's book in the most grand, energetic and stylish manner imaginable, by far the most magnificent signature that I've personally seen someone make. And he wrote, as part of this grand signature, for Stuart Brand, may you discover the whole earth in Cuba. I sneakily had everyone on our trip sign that copy, yearbook style, during the week, and we all presented it to Stuart on our last night in Havana, which almost coincided with his birthday. One of my favorite memories of that trip is sitting at the dining table of our friend's boat as Stuart and his wife paged through it, drinking in those vintage photographs from the late 60s, which came to life as Stuart identified the characters in them and told their stories. I posted pictures of Mr. Wolf signing that magnificent signature. A close-up of the signature in mid-creation unfortunately didn't get the grandest flourishes, but you'll get the gist. And also of his fabulous walking stick in the show notes of this episode, which are linked from the top of the front page of my website at after-on.com. And a final reminder for those who support the show with $5 a month or more on Patreon, there is so much more to this episode on Patreon. More about Ken Kesey and the Merry Pranksters, about Ayn Rand, about acid tests, about Stuart's audacious project to resurrect the passenger pigeon, which didn't make it into the short version of this interview, about human population dynamics, about the crazy hippie stuff my own Midwestern Republican parents used to buy from the Whole Earth catalog. Lots more about the world's first hacker conference and so much more. Please come on over to Patreon and enjoy it. And finally, I'd like to close with something of an encore. It's the last minute or so from the interview you just heard, in which Stuart forecasts what this century holds for us. If there's any prospect at all that he's correct, it certainly bears repeating. Thinking as a planet is what climate change is forcing us to do. Thinking as a civilization rather than just a society or a nation but as a civilization. People in this century get to live in a century where humanity discovers itself as the keeper of life now on a whole planet. What an amazing realization, what an amazing job, what an amazing thing to work out, how that actually works. But all the tools are in place to do that, to make it Earth National Park and the city that you want to live in and the society that continues to become ever more amazing from year to year and decade to decade in a non-destructive way. What's going to happen in this century? 